Shalom. Shalom. You realize that uh, the candle today is peace, right? Shalom means peace. And did you know that one of the Lord's names is the Prince of Peace? And so it's a wonderful time to be here with you today. I want to share first about the ministry that you support. Um, and then I'll share about Hanukkah, this big candelabra here is part of the, the tradition. And I'll be talking about that and, and also the significance between Hanukkah and Christmas, because there are a lot of similarities. The ministry of Rock of Vision was founded by my father. He grew up in an Orthodox home, and so it was a traumatic experience for him to become a believer in Jesus. Most Jewish people do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. In fact, probably over 99% do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Talk about an unreached people group. This is a people that God has said are the chosen people. This is a people that... He created, he created the Jews, and yet most do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And so I'm a missionary to the Jewish people. My father, after he became a believer, was zealous for the Lord, and so he went to Bible school and he became a missionary. He was first a missionary in Haiti, and that's where I was born. I bet you've never met a Jewish Haitian before. <laughs> then he went to Africa. And it was while he was in Africa that God spoke to his heart to come back and start a ministry to his own people. And so he started Rock of Israel Ministries in the, the Los Angeles area. And that was back in 1971. After I graduated from college, he asked me to help him in the ministry. And I did, and later became president of the ministry and moved it from California to uh, Cincinnati. And this is our home base today. Many people ask me, why? Why would I move from sunny Southern California to uh, Ohio? And several of my staff thought we were moving to the North Pole, but of course we, we weren't. Um, and, uh, but it was because of its centrality. I found out that 70% of the U.S. population is east of the Mississippi River, 70%. The other 30% must live in Los Angeles. But anyways, <laughs> uh, in fact, I just got back uh, Friday night from California, and my wife is very uh, emphatic that I wear a ma face mask. She doesn't want me to pass on any germs that I got on the four-hour plane ride or wherever. So uh, I love to fellowship, but please understand I'm going to wear a face mask for your protection, not mine. I, I feel uh, fine, and I trust the Lord for his uh, goodness to me, but I, my wife wants to make sure that you are protected. So, anyways, the, um, uh, we, we moved from California to Ohio, and it was a good move. We began to go to many different cities, handing out thousands of tracts, talking to people on the streets, and uh, meeting many Jewish people. We wore shirts that said, Jesus, the Rock of Israel. And we got to talk to a lot of Jewish people in the uh, main cities like Washington, D.C., New York City, Cleveland, a lot of the major cities, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia. And, but over the years, it's become difficult to have that type of ministry. You know, most people have cell phones today, and everybody's either talking or texting or listening to music, and it's just hard to get their attention on the streets. And so God gave us a different way to encounter Jewish people, and that is through state and county fairs. I don't know if you saw the table in the foyer today as you came in, saw all the, those Jewish items, uh, prayer shawls and anointing oil and, and all those uh, uh, jewelry, Jewish jewelry and, and different things. Well, we take those to state fairs, and it draws Jewish people to us. We don't have to go looking for Jewish people, they come to us. We have a banner that says, Products of Israel, and uh, these products draw Jewish people to us, and we can share with them that we're Jews who believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And of course, that starts a lot of conversations. In fact, I have a short video I'd like to show you about our outreaches at the fairs. Since 2006, 
Rock of Israel Ministries has found a unique way to reach both Jewish and Gentile people with the gospel. In the marketplace, we've been renting booths at state and county fairs. However, one of the best fairs we have found is actually not in the U.S., but in Toronto, Canada. It is at the Canadian National Exposition, also called the CNE, and it has 1.5 million attendees each year. Toronto is a city much like New York, with a very diverse population. We meet more Jewish people here than any other fair. And with our many Jewish and biblical products out there on the table, including books, Art of the Covenant models, jewelry, and more, it brings many curious people over to us each day, much like fishing and faith. For instance, last year at this fair, we were able to share the Messiah with over 325 Jewish people who came to our booth. That number is not even including the hundreds more non-Jewish people we speak with as well. And even if they do not stop to talk, hundreds more will stop dead in their tracks and read our large banner, which says, Jesus made me kosher. Jewish people will stand there for a minute or more and read how Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. Of course, many non-Jewish people stop to read it as well. We cannot tell you how productive this unique banner has been over the years. For those who do come over and talk with us, most will take a bookmark, which is a copy of the banner, Jesus Made Me Kosher, and listen as we share how we are Jews who believe that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, promised to our people. Of course, there will be some who are open to the message. If they are open, we will give them a free book of Jewish testimonies or something similar. Conversely, there are always some who oppose us being there as well. Sometimes we get a visit from local rabbis who seek to stop what we are doing. They show up with video cameras and argue with us. Nevertheless, we are sure that the gospel will go forward no matter what the situation. And the booth in Toronto is just one of the many booths we have rented and continue to rent across North America each year, armed with good volunteer staff who love God and love the Jewish people. With all that being said, may we ask for your help in reaching people? Renting the booth is so uh, next month we'll be going to the South Florida Fair and um, we are excited because you know this year all the fairs had been canceled. Um, you know, we, we were able to go in January to the South Florida Fair in February. We went to the State Fair in Tampa and then in March we set up at the Miami Dade County Fair. We know when to go to Florida, January, February, <laughs> March. But in March, that fair closed, and then every single fair closed after that. And uh, so this year has been a very troubling year for our outreaches, or at least in-person outreaches. We have uh, put more effort into internet evangelism, uh, putting ads on Facebook and, and on Google, and then looking for any way to get you know viewership on the on Facebook, for instance, one of our staff has a cooking show called Taste of Wine. Her name is Wine. And um, then uh, we also, I also, just looking for things to put up, I have what is, uh, we call the story time with Grandpa Specter. And so we're just looking for ways to encounter people on the internet. But uh, we're praying, we, we're expecting that uh, next month we'll be at the South Florida Fair uh, again with our outreach. The secondary ministry for us is what I'm doing this morning, helping Christians understand that the Bible is a Jewish book. Did you know that? Written by Jews. Um, and uh, uh, of course, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But we're helping Christians understand the Bible in its culture and context. Helping Christians see Jesus in the Old Testament. Uh, Jesus said, Moses wrote about me. And so we're helping Christians see uh, Jesus in the Old Testament. And then we also hope to instill in the hearts of Christians a love for the Jewish people, a love for Israel. Um, Jesus cried over Jerusalem. It wasn't the walls, it was the people that he, he, his heart uh, uh, cried for. And we want Christians to love the Jewish people. And so, and to pray for them, that they would know their Messiah. And then the third area of ministry is what I have on the table. I hope you take time after the service to peruse the table and at least pick up one of those bookmarks that was mentioned, the um, Jesus Made Me Kosher bookmark. Pick up one of those, put it in your Bible. Let it be a reminder to pray for our ministries. We're endeavoring to proclaim to the Jewish people that Jesus is the Messiah. The uh, 
there are a lot of things on the table, um, jewelry and prayer shawls and, and a lot of different things, but I want to mention five books real quick. The first book is almost an encyclopedia of Jewish customs and traditions, the feast, the, the Jewish wedding, what a beautiful picture of Jesus and his bride, the, the prayer shawl, the um, uh, bar mitzvah, so much material in here. It's called Jewish Faith and the New Covenant. It was written by Ruth Spector LaSalle. That's my aunt, so it must be good. <laughs> Another book that I recommend is Understanding the Difficult Words of Jesus. There are some times where, uh, because of cultural differences and because of idioms, you know what an idiom is, right? You, if I said, it's raining cats and dogs, you know I'm not talking about animals, right? That's an idiom. Well, even Jesus used Jewish idioms and, and People don't understand what he's saying because they don't know the culture. So understanding the difficult words of Jesus. A book that's about Jesus is called Yeshua, A Guide to the Real Jesus and the Original Church, another book I recommend. And then a book that's not really a religious book, it's more um, uh, maybe political, maybe. It's called Myths and Facts, A Guide to the Arab-Israeli Conflict. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there are church denominations that are against Israel. They are boycotting Israel. They're taking funds away from any investment in Israel. And so this book will give you the facts about their, uh, uh, the, the land being their land. Not only does scripture tell us, you know, the land of Israel was given to Israel, God said forever, you know, he said it to Abraham, he said it to Isaac, he said it to Jacob. It is their land, and in fact, it's a lot more than they have today. Um, but also, it gives the facts of, of how they uh, uh, were able to attain the land in 1948. What, uh, what was that came about that they should have that land. And so, this is a very uh, important book for you to help you to perhaps uh, argue with those who would say that Israel doesn't have a right to the land. The last book I want to mention is called Our Hands Are Stained with Blood. It's a book that I wish every Christian would read. It's the tragic story of the church and the Jewish people. Most Christians don't know what was done in the name of Jesus, the terrible atrocities that have happened in the name of Jesus. And and this is a book I wish every Christian would read. If I were to read to you just the quote alone from Martin Luther, remember Martin Luther was a great uh, father of the church. He's the one that said, by grace are we saved. I mean, he put that on the um, uh, cathedral uh, and, and he was a great proponent of faith. And yet what he said about the Jewish people is terrible. In fact, what Hitler did was suggested by uh, Martin Luther. And so this is a book I wish every Christian would read. Well, enough commercial. <laughs> Let me just say that there are three reasons I hope you take time after the service to look at the table. Number one, some of the material you won't find in your bookstore. In fact, your bookstore probably closed. So today's your opportunity. The second reason is whatever you purchase also supports our ministry. The sale of these items, whether it's books or jewelry or whatever, it, uh, the prophet helps us to pay for those fairs. We have to pay to be at those fairs. We don't just show up. In fact, the one in Canada costs $5,000 just to have a booth. And of course, that doesn't count the travel, lodging, meals, and all the other expenses of an outreach. These are very expensive outreaches, but we have not found a better way to engage Jewish people in conversation. And so your purchase today will also support our ministry. And by the way, I came prepared. If you didn't, I have an app on my phone to take your credit card. So I'm ready if you are. And uh, the third reason is every item you buy is one less I'm going to have to pack up afterwards. So there's a good reason. But this morning, I want to share with you about Hanukkah. Uh, I don't know. How many of you know what Hanukkah is? Maybe I should start there. I don't see... One, a couple people. All right, there are three. Well, Hanukkah is a wonderful tradition. You know, uh, I think it was Troy or somebody this morning just said uh, that tradition is good. You know, if it, especially, I would say it's good if it draws us to God, right? Uh, any tradition that 
and reminds us of the goodness of God is a good tradition. And, um, and so Hanukkah is a wonderful tradition. It's a family tradition that uh, celebrates uh, what, what happened in the past, but also what is happening even uh, today. And so uh, Hanukkah is a, a holiday. It's not, though, a holiday that is mentioned in the Old Testament. Now, there are feasts in the Old Testament that God said, you know, you're going to celebrate these feasts forever. And so those are, are, are important uh, traditions and holidays. But this one isn't mentioned in the Old Testament because it's a celebration of an event that happened after uh, what you call the Old Testament. Of course, Jewish people don't call it the Old Testament. They call it the Tanakh or the Holy Scriptures, and the Hebrew Scriptures. And uh, so, you know, I, I don't really think we should call the Old Testament the Old Testament because it implies that, you know, it's not important. And of course, it is important. It's God's Word. Um, and so the Old Testament is a terrible name for uh, God's Word. Regardless, Hanukkah is not mentioned in the Old Testament. Well, it is mentioned, but not the holiday is mentioned. The word is mentioned. Hanukkah means dedication. And so, of course, the word is in the Old Testament. There's the dedication of the altar. There's the dedication of, the, the, of David's house. There's the dedication of the wall. Remember Nehemiah uh, rebuilding the wall had a dedication. And so that's Hanukkah. Hanukkah is dedication. But uh, the, uh, the story of Hanukkah, what is celebrated today, actually happened between the Old Testament, quote-unquote, and the New Testament. It happened in, you know, those 400 years between. Uh, it actually happened uh, during the time about uh, 168 is the actual event that happened. So this was almost 200 years before Jesus uh, that Hanukkah happened. Now, um, uh, let me see. Th this is uh, uh, what we call a Hanukkah, a Hanukkah candelabra. And uh, uh, this particular one is made so that it could be used with oil or candles. I have uh, candles in there because oil is a little messy. And um, and the uh, Hanukkah, or the Hanukkah candelabra, has nine candles. And uh, one of them is a little higher than the others and is used to light the other eight candles. And so um, I, I'm, I'm sure you've seen a, a, a menorah, a, a candelabra, before, and perhaps you wondered why are there nine when you thought that there were supposed to be seven, right? You know, seven, the perfect number, and uh, in the tabernacle, there was the menorah that had seven branches, right? So why are there nine branches on this particular uh, candelabra? Well, the reason is, is that it's a celebration of eight days, and you have the servant candle that lights the eight days of Hanukkah. There's not nine days of Hanukkah, although my children wish there were. Um, they are eight days of Hanukkah, one to light the eight days, kind of like you did this morning with the uh, candle you lit the other candles. And so um, Hanukkah is a celebration of eight days. Hanukkah is also a celebration of a, uh, a, uh, uh, a deliverance, a, a, a time when Israel was able to overcome their enemies. And so Hanukkah is a celebration of, of the fact that even the small army of Israel was able to defeat the large army of the Syrians. 
what happened was that uh, when Alexander the Great conquered the known world and he died young, he, you know, his kingdom was divided between four generals and, and one of the generals was over this area of uh, the east, um, the uh, Middle East. And uh, one of his descendants was um, called uh, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes. And this, uh, this man, he wanted to strengthen his, his uh, uh, hold over the area. And so he wanted everybody to adopt Greek, Greek culture and uh, uh, worship Greek gods and and not follow after any other gods. But of course, Israel was worshiping the only true God, the God of Israel. And so there was a, a problem here. You have the king saying you have to worship, you know, Zeus and these Greek gods and, and um, Israel... The priests of Israel say, no, we're not going to do that. Well, this, uh, this story is found in um, the book of Maccabees in um, some Bibles, uh, probably not yours, mostly in Catholic Bibles. You'll find uh, the uh, books that are kind of historical books in between the, the two Testaments. And so in the book of Maccabees, 1st uh, Maccabees and 2nd Maccabees, you'll find this story of how this e evil king caught, tried to force Israel to worship a false god. Not only did he try to force them to worship a false god, but they, he installed his priests in the holy temple and those priests offered uh, uh, pigs on the altar and desecrated the altar of God. And, and so um, this all happened in 168 uh, BCE or before uh, Jesus. And so uh, the story goes that uh, there rose up a family in uh, Israel that uh, fought against the Syrians. And uh, they, uh, the, the, the father's name is Matthias, and he, he is uh, uh, doing warfare. He, he challenges the people to rise up against this evil king. And, um, and they, um, they, uh, uh, they, you know, have this war. He dies, and his sons take over, and... One of his sons, his name is Judah, and he's called the Maccabee because um, it, it means hammer, and he hammers against, you know, against these Syrians who are uh, trying to make, force them not to follow after the true God. And so this story goes on in that he wins. You know, they, they, they do guerrilla warfare and, and uh, they hide in the hills and come down and attack the Syrian army. And finally, the, the king gives up. He says there, he's putting too much effort in this little tiny country. He takes his people, his armies out and, and leaves Israel to uh, their own devices. And so they win the small army the Maccabees win the uh, war, and uh, Judah declares that this is this uh, victory is to be celebrated as an eight-day holiday uh, every year. For they had not been able to celebrate, you know, the feasts uh, that are in the Bible. They were not able to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, which is a seven-day holiday, and so. They celebrate Hanukkah in celebration of the fact that they won the war and uh, they are they can worship the true God. Amen. And so uh, this Hanukkah is a celebration of God's help for the small army to win out over the evil oh. king. Hallelujah. Good. That's a wonderful story. And how does it affect you? 
It's a very important war for your sake. For had they not delivered the temple, had they not been able to worship the king uh, or to worship the only true God, then the temple would not have been rededicated and in time for the, the advent of Jesus to come to be proclaimed king of the Jews. If the temple had not been reclaimed, then the prophets could not recognize Jesus as the king. And so it's an important holiday that was, that was in, necessary for the temple to be rededicated unto God. And so that Jesus could come and, and be teaching at the temple so that he could be proclaimed the Messiah and king. And so this is an important holiday even for Christians. There are also many similarities between um, Hanukkah and Christmas. Um, in, uh, over time, um, perhaps 700 years after the fact, there became a, a legend that grew up out of this celebration that when they went into the temple to rededicate it, there wasn't enough sacred oil to light the menorah or the eternal light. And so uh, they only found one cruise of oil. And this one cruise of oil would have only lasted one day. But a miracle happened, and that one cruise of oil lasted eight days, enough time for them to manufacture new oil that was not desecrated uh, from the, um, you know, the uh, uh, false uh, priests and uh, false worship. And so uh, the, there is this legend that the, the oil lasted for eight days. How many of you, I'm just curious, how many of you have been experienced a time when God made something last longer than it should have? Yeah, I think that happens with my gas all the time <laughs> in my car. But I know, I know a lady that told me that uh, it's hard to believe. You may have this. You may have a hard time believing this, but she was having a difficult time financially. But every time she opened her cupboard door, there was food there. Do you believe that? Yes. God can do it. He can make things last. He can make, you remember, in, even in the wilderness, the, the clothes, the shoes on uh, the children of Israel's feet, they lasted for 40 years. So God is able. Amen. And if today perhaps you're having a difficult time, know that God is able. God is able. And so I want to talk a little bit about the... Uh, similarities between Hanukkah and Christmas. By the way, I said that it, that Hanukkah is not mentioned in the Old Testament, at least not as a, a celebration or, or rather a, a holiday, but it is mentioned in the New Testament. In, um, in John, if you have your Bible, you can see where it's mentioned in John chapter 10, verses 22 and 23, it says that Jesus was at the temple. It was winter, and Jesus was at the temple at the Feast of Dedication, or Fe Feast of Lights. This is another name for this holiday. Besides Hanukkah, or dedication, it's also called the Feast of Lights because there was the tradition of having bonfires, and, and now we have the lights of the uh, Hanukkah. But here we have Jesus walking in the temple at the Feast of Dedication. And so it was a celebration in Jesus' day, and uh, it has become a very prominent celebration today, even though it's not mentioned in the Old Testament. So we have uh, in the candles, uh, the nine, nine candles. I'm going to use your, instead of using the one uh, that we would normally use to light the candles. Let me use yours. If I can get it. There. And then what we do is we start on the left. And on the 
first night, we light the first candle. And so for the first night, only one is lit. And then the second night of Hanukkah, we light the second one. And so on the second night, two are lit. And then on the third night, three are lit. Actually, we start with the third, for instance, say, uh, today would be the fifth, fourth night. We would light the fourth, and then the third, second, and first. And then on the fifth night, we would start with the fifth one, and have five lit. And then on the sixth night, and this is a light. Anyways, you get the idea. So then, on the eighth night, all the candles are lit, and I can't really see the light. But anyways. Oh my God! I hope that wasn't an error. No. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. So we have. Eight lights lit uh, for the eighth night of Hanukkah, and I'm sure you know you'll see at least on um, you know in the news or whatever you'll see. And the first night of Hanukkah this year, uh, because it doesn't la uh, land on the same day every year, this year it begins on the uh, the 11th of uh, December, but just. Um, you have to also remember, even though it, the first day is the 11th, uh, the Jewish day doesn't start with day, right? In the, uh, in the beginning, there were, you remember, there was evening and morning were the first day, right? So we start with evening. So on the 10th is actually the first night of Hanukkah. The first day is the 11th, and uh, we'll go for eight days of Hanukkah. And uh, we'll have eight uh, lights lit, and we'll have, uh, some will have it in their window, much like some people put their Christmas tree in their uh, front window. And so the uh, holiday uh, this year begins uh, on the evening of the 10th, and we'll go for eight days. So uh, it has become a very family-oriented holiday. It's become a very uh, fun holiday. There's a lot of food. You know, tradition is that you make things with, uh, you know, that are made with oil because this is, you know, the tradition. The oil lasted for eight days, so we make, you know, potato pancakes and we make. Uh, uh, donuts fried in oil, and Amen. and so there, yeah, there we go. And uh, you know, uh, I I was uh, about a week in California, and I, I had been dieting. Uh, COVID. One of the silver linings for me for COVID was that I had uh, you know got a treadmill and was working on losing weight. I did pretty well and until I went to California, and every day I had donuts. Uh, <laughs> uh, I got to get back on the bandwagon, but maybe after Hanukkah I'll do that. <laughs> the um, and so Hanukkah is a family tradition that uh, children love. Uh, as I said, my children want a you know a ninth day and a tenth day because every day of Hanukkah you get a gift, and uh, you know uh, I'm sure that there's probably some. Um, Competition between Christmas and Hanukkah, and so the, the Jewish uh, parents want to make sure that the kids enjoy their holiday as much as all the Christians enjoy their Christmas holiday, and so they they give a gift every uh, day. Now, well, we were we did this with our children, and yet um, my wife was uh, a little stingy with this because uh, you know sometimes she'd give them like a toothbrush. Come on. What's with that? A toothbrush? 
Anyway, so you know, every day you get a gift. And so uh, it's a, a fun time, a lot of food, a lot of uh, games, a lot of um, songs. Uh, how many of you have heard of the, the song, you know, my, I had a little dreidel and made it out of clay? No? Yeah. You haven't heard? Anyways, there's a lot of songs, and in dreidels are our games. Uh, that are played at, at Hanukkah. These are games of chance, you know, whatever it lands on. Uh, you have to do what uh, that side of the top says to do. And so uh, there is a lot of fun with Hanukkah. But let me give you some of the similarities between Hanukkah and Christmas. The first thing that we see is the date. The date of Hanukkah begins on the 25th day of Kislev, the winter month of Ki Kislev. Now, this was decreed by the uh, by uh, Judah Maccabee, and uh, so that was way back in 165 uh, is when they finally were re able to retake the temple. So, in 165, he declared that that this was the date that would be celebrated as Hanukkah. Well, we know that uh, a couple hundred years after Jesus, or uh, in the third century, that uh, it is written that, that the 25th day of December would be celebrated as the uh, birth of Jesus. Very similar, uh, perhaps it was uh, taking the earlier date of Hanukkah. The second thing we see in uh, comparing the two holidays is a tree. Now, um, in, uh, uh, at Christmas time, there are many trees with lights, and uh, this is a celebration of this time. And, and uh, in Hanukkah, we have somewhat of a tree. Can't you see the branches and, and uh, the lights on the Hanukkah tree? Actually, um, there's even uh, some who have a Hanukkah bush and, um, and again, a, a desire to have uh, something similar to a tree. And so there are uh, similarities there. There's also lights. Lights are very much part of both celebrations. Um, we not only uh, see the beautiful lights on the Christmas tree, on the houses, uh, and um, uh, in uh, Jewish homes, you have the candles that are lit, but also you might also see blue and white lights to signify uh, the celebration uh, of this time. And then uh, another similarity are the gifts that are given. Of course, uh, Christmas is the time for giving gifts, and... Um, and uh, in Hanukkah, we now uh, have established traditions of a gift for every night of Hanukkah. But I must say that the most important gift, of course, is the gift of God. That God, for God so loved the world, he didn't just love the Jews, he loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. And so, uh, the most important gift of both holidays is actually Jesus, for he is not only the servant candle that lights all the others, but he is the light of the world. And, um, and then there's, uh, besides gifts at both holidays, there's a miracle at both holidays. We... I talked about the miracle of the small army defeating the big army. I talked about the miracle of the oil that lasted for eight days when it should have only lasted one day. And the miracle of Christmas is, of course, the virgin birth where uh, God gave his son and that this son is an everlasting son of God. He isn't uh, one that is... is uh, only man, he is God. He is forever. He was, he is, and he is to come. Hallelujah. And so this, this miracle of the birth 
of the babe that would become king over all the world. Uh, both our, our family holidays that are celebrations to bring the family together, the traditions that, that, uh, that are not only fun, but uh, bring together families. It's an important time. Of course, there are people that have lost family members, and, and it's a hard time for them, but, but it, for most of us, it's a joyous time of, of being with uh, family. And then there's an enemy in both, of course, Antiochus Epiphanes was the enemy of uh, Israel and of the, the people of God, the children of Israel. And uh, Herod was the enemy of Christmas, for he killed uh, thousands of children trying to uh, kill the newborn king. And so we have an enemy uh, there. But the, the, the uh, worst enemy, of course, is Satan, who has throughout time tried to do away with the Jewish people. He has tried to kill them at, uh, through, uh, uh, remember Esther's time when the Jews were uh, threatened and, and many times after uh, through the Crusades, through the pogroms of Russia, through the uh, Holocaust and, and many times uh, past that uh, Satan has tried to kill the Jewish people. Satan is also try to kill uh, the, the, the uh, gospel message that the kingdom of God is, is coming. Uh, I was so uh, impressed to hear that this is your uh, mission statement that, and that you pray that thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God rules in heaven, but someday the king will rule on earth over all the earth. The, the prophets say that, that there will be a time when if the, the nations do not go to the king to worship the king, they won't have rain. Amen. And so we know that there's going to be a day when the king will be over all this earth. And uh, we are to pray that thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. He rules in heaven. We can look around us today and say that there are many who are not subject to his rule. And but someday every knee will bow Amen. and every tongue confess that he is Lord. And so there is an enemy, but there's also a hero, of course, uh, for Hanukkah. The, uh, the hero is uh, Judah Maccabee. He was a servant and a hero. Uh, but Jesus is a servant. He came to give his life so that we would have eternal life. And he is the hero, for he is the king. He is coming back. Hallelujah. And so there are many similarities between Hanukkah and Christmas. Both are times when we can celebrate what God has done and is going to do. And his kingdom will come. In fact, many people ask me questions. Sometimes the questions uh, I can answer, like, you know, for instance, some people, or many people ask me, how do I keep this on my head? My wife tells them that I use push pins, but of course that's not true. Um, so there are easy questions, but then, then there are other questions that are about prophecy, and that, when is Jesus coming? And those are harder to answer, because we don't know the hour. In fact, I want to remind you what Jesus said in Acts 1, uh, he says, uh, let me begin with, uh, let's see, verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, he didn't say, oh, you stupid people, don't you get it? He didn't say that. He didn't say, 
you've got this all wrong, you don't have the right picture. He didn't tell him that. He didn't say that it was a foolish question. What he did say is, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so those of you who are questioning when is Jesus coming, I say to you, it's not for you to know. But you shall receive power, and you shall be my witnesses. That is your job. You are called to be his witnesses. And so don't worry about when he is coming. He's coming. He's coming. Just trust that. He is coming. But you are called to be his witnesses. And just as Israel was called to be a light to the nations, that was their job, that was their purpose, you have been drafted in, and that is your purpose. You shall be my witnesses. So don't worry about when Jesus is coming. Worry about fulfilling the call of God in your lives. So today... I ask you to reset yourselves on this time of Hanukkah and this time of celebration of the miracles of God and this time when we are looking for his soon return. Rededicate yourselves to his purpose, to be his witnesses to your co-laborers, your co-workers, to your stores and, and wherever you are. For this is a time when many are afraid and we have the answer. We have the spirit within us. Don't worry about what to say. In fact, I was sharing that at a church in Florida and, and I said, uh, don't worry about what you're going to say. God will use you. He can't, he just can't use what you don't say, right? And a man came up to me afterwards and he said, I know exactly what you mean. He said, I was ministering in music. I had a dry throat. I had to leave. I put my hand on a man's shoulder as I left the auditorium. He came and he said, I got to get a drink. When he came back into the auditorium, that man was at the altar praying for salvation. And he talked to him afterwards. He said, what happened? He said, well, when you said I had to go to the altar, I went. And the man thought, hmm, I said, I got to get a drink. How does that translate to you have to go to the altar? But God made his mouth. God made the man's ear. God can make him hear what he intends he hears. So don't worry. Of course, don't try to offend people, of course. But let God use the words that you can say. For he knows the heart of every man. Let him use you to draw people to himself. Let's spread it, rededicate ourselves to his, his word, his will. Shalom. Will you stay with me for just a second, Robert? I want to ask you to pray over us. Pastor Travis and I felt it was very important that Robert come this year. I don't know if you've been paying attention to the feasts. We've been paying attention all year to the feasts. It's been more prevalent in our sight. We need to remember, folks. We need to remember. We need to call to remembrance the goodness of the Lord. When we go to the Bible, we need to read it so that we have faith to move in the testimony that it has gone before us. What I see here is miraculous power of victory. This is where we need to stand in this year and in this time. If he did it then, come on. And then he did it at the birth of Jesus Christ. And then he did it at the resurrection. Then he can do it again here today. That is why we're here. That is why Hanukkah, Christmas, why the word of God is vital. It's vital. If you don't have the word going in you every day, I challenge you. We need the scriptures to be going in us and coming out. He will equip us to do exactly what he has called and anointed us to do. And we dedicate ourselves today, this Christmas, to not just go through the motions. I know that can't even be this year. The motions are different this year. 
And I believe the motions are on our knees and in the word of God and then out loving our neighbor. Amen. Remember. That's why they built altars. To remember. Not just to remember the battle. Come on. But to remember the goodness of God. Above all else, he is good. And we are here today to be dedicated to the Lord. Will you stand? It's so funny, Travis whispered, pray a prayer of dedication over the body. Because Hanukkah is the dedication, it's the remembrance, and it's the feast of lights. We've been in a season where we're talking about breakthrough and about the light of life, Jesus Christ. So will you dedicate in prayer us this morning? Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, do a work again in our hearts. May it burst forth where your word will come forth from our lips, that we will be your witnesses, that we will testify of your work in our lives. Lord, put that deep within us. Put a, a deep desire to do your work and your will. God told Abraham, or rather told Moses, to tell his brother Aaron to bless the people this way. He said to bless the children of Israel this way. shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and bring you peace. Hashem Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of our Messiah, Jesus. God bless you. Shalom. Amen. Can I pray over you? Yes. Father, Thank you for bringing Robert to us today. Thank you for the ministry that he has been called and anointed to do, to bring life, to bring the Messiah to the Jewish people. I pray you would anoint his steps. I pray you would provide financially, miraculously, again and again, like the oil that never ran out, the provision will never run out. Because it is your heart that your people know that there is a Redeemer that has come and has called them by name, Jesus the Messiah. I pray an anointing over his household. I pray an anointing from generation to generation that this good news would continue to be proclaimed. At every state fair, Father, I pray that would open back up, doors would open this year, unique doors, doors that they didn't expect to open in 2021. I pray that the gospel would go forth for the nations to know you. And as we give, I pray you would bless our offering. I pray you would bless the finances that pour out today and it would be multiplied in Jesus' name. We praise you, Lord, and we thank you that you sent your son to save and redeem. And I pray that not only would they see open doors, but they would see hundreds of thousands of salvations, Jesus. In your name we ask. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. We love you. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next Sunday.